Hi everyone, and this is Tagor Almeida from the Uncultured Company, and welcome to my podcast, A Pint of Imbecile Wisdom. And today's podcast is amazing because we're talking about music. Music plays an integral part of our existence. We associate music with every part of our life, uh, whether and they become huge bookmarks in memories of what we've gone through. So we clearly remember songs during certain parts of our lives or we remember the parts of our lives when we we hear a certain song from, from the past so music is an amazing thing today with me i've got susmit sen who i am so honored to be able to talk to he is a musician par excellence and when i say that it's not because he's on my show but when we start talking to him you'll see the the body of work that he's been doing and that he's been associated with he was the founder of one of india's most amazing fusion rock bands called indian ocean and any indian out there would have heard of indian ocean and especially of the song called kandisa which in my opinion is on every person's playlist either for a road trip or a dark night when they're hanging out with friends smoking the right stuff or drinking the right stuff so it's played a huge part uh, in all of our lives and it's just amazing to be able to talk to this individual so hi susmit and welcome to the podcast this is uh, season 1 episode 6 and we're talking about music hi hi tagore thank you for having me here it's uh, i'm sure we'll have a great time speaking today absolutely and uh, the few friends that i have in my life and i told them that i was podcasting with you they couldn't believe it so this is you know showing my tongue to them and saying this is really happening so susmit let's start let's start with you a little bit but before we do that susmit you know the rule of the podcast you got to be having a drink with you so what's your drink for I, for this session and why is it why is it your drink i i i have my drink with me it's rum and for the last 40 years it has been rum my main uh, alcohol consumption is rum Is this rum and coke? And it, it, this doesn't happen to be old monk, is it? It is old monk. Oh, yay! Classic. Yeah, they should be paying me a royalty. <laughs> exactly. This is legendary <laughs> stuff. Old monk is once upon a time the only alcohol we could actually afford to drink, and it stayed with us as we've grown up. And even though we can afford other alcohols now, old monk is still part of our DNA. So hats off to you. I'm trying yeah. to uh, overcome a sore throat so I've got a little bit of brandy with some hot water. Still a very boring drink. But so so let's start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about you, about yourself. I mean, you know, I'm going to be talking about this amazing body of work that you've been that you've been doing, but let's start, talk about you. So, uh, you know, where did it all start and and how did it all start really? Ah um, well I I did not know while growing up that I'm going to take to music. I was interested in music. I uh, had a guitar at home because my brother was gifted a guitar by my father. And uh, it used to lie around and I picked up the guitar I started playing and then what happened was that initial days yes one of those very few simple chords and play some Beatles and uh, I should not say simple chords and Beatles because Beatles use some of the most amazing chords but say bob dylan and uh, you know uh, some of the words uh, but uh, sometime in my late school i got introduced to uh, indian classical music and that is where things mm-hmm. changed okay. and i uh, i was um, yeah i got uh, so involved with it and i was so affected by indian classical music and i uh, also was lucky enough to be born at a time when i saw some of the greatest musicians play at the peak you know uh, people like nikhil banerjee uh, bhimsen joshi ali akbar khan sahab um malikarjun mansoor and then there were other recorded stuff i was introduced to amir khan sahab and so on so it was uh, an amazing i mean uh, journey because i first started going to their concerts and it, it used to take me to some other world altogether or uh, some other universe and uh, and what i was most impressed by was their capability to to uh, lose themselves during their performances and uh, that kind of told me like what what i was playing on the guitar was not 
quite the thing that I wanted to play. So I started uh, uh, emulating them. I've never learned music in my life, but Indian wow. classical has had biggest uh, influence on me. Yes. Okay, so you've but never I had any formal music training? Not, not even one class. Uh, that's really interesting because you know if anyone listens to you playing the the depth and the technique of of, of what you do with the guitar is incredible and it's and it, it it showcases the knowledge that you have and the discipline that you have about the you know the indian scales and the little bit of jazz a little bit of blues a little bit of rock folk that you actually so nicely bring into this one piece of music you know so how how do you manage to do that without any any formal musical education? Uh, all I can see, if I had a formal music education, maybe I wouldn't have been able to switch from one genre to the other. But uh, I think what happens is that whatever you have grown up with, uh, listening to different kinds of music, uh, I think uh, you know the basic. Uh, Mm, what should I say? Um, there, there is an aesthetic sense through which you you want to express yourself, and uh, uh, those emotions uh, are there, and those emotions get uh, portrayed in a certain way. And every person portrays their own emotions in different ways in music. So, uh, in my opinion, the aesthetics makes a lot of difference as to how uh, you want to do it. Uh, regarding the complexity, again, it comes very naturally to me. I mean, initially, what I used to do was, uh, if you actually go by the chronology of my uh, compositions, uh, I used to basically take up one particular scale and compose a piece on that. But by and by, I realized that there is nothing called a wrong note. So every note is perfectly fine till the time you know how to use it. And probably that is what you're calling um, complexity. And yes, the thing is that my compositions also, you know, changes scales in between. It changes modes. It changes the root note also. And I also tend to many a times change the beat pattern altogether in the middle of the song. So uh, maybe that is what you're uh, talking about complexity. Um, yeah. But yeah, tell me. No, no, no. Yes, I, I, I was, I, I was saying yes. I was agreeing with you. Yeah, but you know, so Smith, I was, uh, I, I was listening to to one of your compositions earlier today, and my w wife was hovering around the house like she usually does, and you know, at the end of it, after a good fifteen minutes, I told her, "What did you think of the piece?" And her only reaction to me was, "She goes, I was listening to it." She goes, "And I could hear it." She goes, was that one song? Because it sounded like many songs. And I had to explain to her that it was one song that was so amazing that it had different melodies, it had different beats, it had different sections, it had different rhythms. And it was just incredible how you managed to put all of these complexities into one piece of music. Okay. Another thing that stood out to me when I was watching one of your videos was, and I was watching the Iceberg Project, which I'm going to come to in a minute. Yep. None of the other musicians, there were another three musicians around you. Mm. Not one yep. of them had a piece of music scored in front of them. And yet it was perfection to a melody that I can only uh, refer to as really complex. And they all knew their parts. They all came at the right time. And it was perfectly performed. And I have never seen this sort of music being performed except for, and I say this very respectfully, another Indian band called Shakti. Okay? Shakti also yeah. do something very similar where they have such complex pieces of music, multiple musicians on stage, and not a single sheet of music in front of them, and they just play from their soul. So how does this happen, Sushmit? I mean, I'm sure, I mean, you know, when you compose this piece of complex music that sometimes... 15, 20 minutes long. How do you mm. manage to get other musicians to come on board and connect emotionally? And I don't mean that just technically, because there's no music score in front of them. How do you, how, how does that magic happen? 
Uh, firstly, um, I must tell you that uh, there are no she- she- sheets in front of any of the musicians because uh, because uh, I myself cannot read and write music, uh, and therefore um, sometimes other musicians do come and they write down certain things. But when it comes to playing, um, I I do believe in memorizing the whole thing, and uh, I also f- uh, think that memorizing a, a complex piece of music. Uh, is not that difficult because there is an unsaid logic by which a composition is taken from one part to the uh, uh, to another, and uh, that I think that feel um, I am lucky to have amazing musicians around me, and they feel it and they um, uh, they they seem to grasp it uh, quite easily. But practice is a huge huge thing. We do practice. before we go for a show or uh, a recording like this and uh, especially actually um, i must tell you like the cello player tapan malik yeah he used to find it very difficult initially because he's been trained in western classical music and he is an amazing player yeah. right yeah but but by and by i saw that he's been able to get my logic that unsaid logic in a composition and uh, the most uh, um, i think the 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 best example that i can give is melanie melanie who has played with me for quite some time and she yeah. played a lot of my compositions now uh, tapan uh, at least i mean he has grown up in india but melanie never knew about indian music at all and uh, yet what she has given uh, with her uh, brilliance to my music is really uh, Mm. Um, I, I have no words for it, no, and, and that that too. No, and it shows it, it shows in that connect between you and Melanie and Nandit, or you and your fellow other musicians in the Iceberg Project. That connect, that emotional connect, not just the intelligence, but that emotional connect is so visible, and it's amazing how you guys have been able to do that. You know, I'm going to talk about Melanie in a minute, uh, and but let's talk about. the indian ocean to the susmit sen trio to the iceberg project what was through that journey i mean how did all of that come along well indian ocean was a great journey i mean uh, there, there was this uh, some seed in my mind which uh, told me that i should uh, form a band because uh, when i uh, started composing i started playing with oshim and we were just a duo that was way back in 84 85 and our first show was in 86 and uh, then when we realized although very few shows uh, uh the sh- each gig used to be so successful that uh, we uh, i at least i realized that i need to expand the sound of the band it, it can't be just tabla and guitar so uh, i wanted to form a band so finally i could manage to do that in 1990 and uh, there were quite a few people at that point of time uh, so i recorded well it's a long journey it's a long long journey I recorded a demo tape uh, to be sent to different um, music companies and then hmv uh, fell for it hmv said that i we would like to release this and uh, it, it's quite uh, uncanny i was working with hmv at that point of time oh, okay. and then my repertoire manager from uh, he was in bombay or kolkata at that point of time not remembering because they shifted their head office from kolkata to bombay uh, and that was around the time when i had joined them so he had asked me vt ravi uh, was his name um, and he asked me why don't you just look out for bands in delhi because i was looking after repertoire as well as sales of uh, indian classical and western music so i i did choose a, a few bands send them uh, sent them my uh, those recordings as well as mine without telling him that this is my music and he reverted back saying that i would like to release this that's the time i had to tell him that this is my band and uh, so that is where it all started and uh, yeah um, first album came out in uh, uh when was it 93 december 93 and then it was you know it, there were there are loads of stories within such a short time i would not be able to tell um and then i was with indian ocean for 
23 and a half years and wow. uh, in between uh, Oshim passed away and Oshim was the first person I mean I, the only person who was there till the uh, towards the end and who was there when I started the band and therefore that was a huge loss huge 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 loss what uh, an amazing human being and what uh, what a musician um and uh, yeah so before that itself there there was a part of my mind which wanted to uh leave the band and start something afresh uh and oshim knew about it and oshim knew about it uh but when oshim died my first instinct was to make the band continue so uh, again the way i had started the band you know so many years back 20 years back at that point of time right now it is 31 years which are completed of indian ocean so uh, we found other musicians and we uh, um, lovely musicians so uh, we could get the ball rolling back on the road so um, after that i stayed there for another 3 3 and a half years and then i left and uh, i wanted to because i think there is always a saturation point even if it is your own creation and then i started doing stuff with my band called uh, uh, sushmit sen chronicles and um, two albums came out and then i started uh, this collaboration with melanie and yeah it has been a long journey so it has been a long journey and there is much to come still and, and and then you had the iceberg project so was that the last there of is... your babies no or, or, uh, no, no. or, or rather was it the the most recent of your creations no 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 there's another one which i have not really named right now for just uh, the sake of it i have called it uh, up 49 um so that is also uh, uh, in the pipeline i would be releasing it within this year i'm sure about that and uh, then another company called tanakya records they are basically uh, figuring out some legendary albums and uh, uh, you know releasing uh, lps vinyls of them so they have already released two of indian ocean and some more they were planning i did not know what was my uh, status with uh, uh the music companies which i had uh, signed contracts with but now i know that all the rights of those two albums are with me so yep, exactly. that will also get yeah so that also will get uh, republished and um and, and there are quite a few other compositions which because of the pandemic for the last one year i have not been able to actually work with any other a uh, musician to work them out but there are a lot of new composed compositions which are still there which needs to be thrashed out with other musicians okay you know we're talking about like we releasing if you work once upon a time and this is when i when i should live in london I, i would come down to india every once a year and one of my favorite things that i should do mainly in bombay and in goa was going to a music shop all by myself no time limits and actually go through every a uh, cd on the shelf and look specifically for independent music from india and you know that's how i that's how i came across people like 1380 and you know rock machine and leslie lewis and harry yeah. haran and yourselves yeah. for example uh for a long time and even before the cd so called industry died there wasn't much of a choice that was offered to someone like me looking for independent music in india okay uh the shelves are honestly speaking the shelves are overloaded with film music and there's nothing wrong with that but it's just that it seems that my my you know the buffet is only having one dish on the on the menu and that's film music whether it's bollywood or from chennai or whatever it is and what does that do to the fabric of society just made because i believe that music plays an integral part in the voice of a nation and not having an independent voice of music can be alarming uh not this that there isn't any uh, independent music happening in this country 
but the uh, hegemony of bali i would say it's a hegemony of wealth and money okay that is is always going to overpower the rest of the music that is being uh, produced anywhere in this world actually actually not anywhere it's more in india it's more in india because i right. think independent music, uh elsewhere in the world is far more recognized than what it is out here it also probably reflects the economic status of this country and the uh, uh the population uh, probably the um, the people who do get to hear independent music and are not just you know battered by uh by uh, you know bollywood which has got so much of advertisements with each of their movies coming out um that will never happen with the uh, independent music neither will it happen with classical music okay not in this country um so um so the penetration of uh, music of say indian ocean or say 1380 and rock machine has, will never be as much as what bollywood does right so that's uh, uh, a reality that we, we 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 should be just accepting okay um but but the pleasure of creating your own stuff and putting it up on your own is uh that pleasure probably not many bollywood musicians get to go through if i may say so no no I, and i think so because okay let's talk about uh, i mean if you look at like a, another great guitarist in india ehsan durani yeah if he yeah. had not gone into bollywood right right how much of india would have heard of him it, it, it's a very real question because he's he's an he's a he's a really good talented guitarist okay but if, if if he was not in that whole ehsan loy shankar you know setup how many right. people would have heard of him number one number two and somebody who i look up to very much who's a fellow goan is my dear friend remo fernandez you know who's right. always stood his ground wanted to do his own stuff create his own uh, label but even he's okay. had to go and and when he's ventured into bollywood that's actually done amazing stuff for for the brand that he holds and also helped with the independent music that he does yeah so it's, right. it it almost feels that if you're not involved with that industry of films in india your you know your reach is somehow unfortunately limited um, um 99% true yes okay what's the one thing that 1% i'll tell you because uh, i think i think the most i still i would think that the most uh, sold album of indian ocean is kandisa that was before we entered bollywood correct yeah i mean that's that's legendary and i i think that's very unique suspeet i mean come on i don't think many bands can actually talk about a song like kandisa like the way you guys had kandisa i don't think many other I'm bands i'm talking about the album Okay. I'm not just talking about the, uh, the song. Uh, okay. The song, yeah. Okay. And so, uh, which was the record hmm. label that produced Kandisa? That that did, did that. Kandisa was with Times Music. With Times Music, okay. All right. Yeah. So now you're talking about you know H uh, HMV Times Music. You know you had I think once upon a time we had Magna Sound or something like that. See at CBS. I mean, all these. Yeah, different- yeah, yeah. There were, lots of them. there were lots of them, and I and I did work for the music industry, so uh, I uh, know that very well. Exactly how things were changing. But you are you keep talking about Kandisa. Have you heard Desert Train? I've heard Desert Train. Yep, yep. Yeah. So that was the album before Kandisa. Not okay. the first album. First album was self named. um the second album was a live album which was called desert rain i think desert rain was the breaking point where people turned around and they wanted to sign us wow. okay okay cuz the first album was a uh, was a really a good success in those days to sell about almost 40 50000 uh, cassettes uh, uh was a huge deal and um and uh, even then no company was willing to pick us up 
whereas when desert rain happened so i went to one of the dealers who had sold the first album and said that listen i want to distribute it because we went to magna sound we went to various different uh, companies and they said that listen your your first album was a flop your second album will definitely be a flop <laughs> okay okay uh, so i went to this uh, uh, dealer who i uh, used to deal with and said listen we have come up with this uh, new album and uh, you would like to make you listen to that so that uh, uh, you can see how to distribute it you know if we produce it ourselves so he said that i am not even going to listen to it because i have sold so much of your uh, first album that uh, i will produce it so he um he started uh, a company called uh, independent music okay and and he uh, released it in the market and that when that sold you know 50000 a lakh of copies or something i do not remember exactly what the numbers were and also uh, uh, before we knew it was being pirated in nepal and things like that Okay. So that is the time when these companies, for the first time, wanted to talk to us. So that led to Kandisha. Okay. Wow. By the way, how did this song come about, Kandisha? I mean, what were you thinking of? I mean, because you know, um, it's it's hauntingly addictive, you know. So where were you okay. when you came so up I, with I'll, that? I'll, I'll, This particular song came to India about two thousand years back. We do not know exactly when. When the Syrian Christians came in, that is the time you know uh, a language called Aramaic was being spoken, mm-hmm. especially in places like Kerala and maybe certain parts of uh, the western coast. But Kerala definitely, and that is where uh, the uh, song used to be sung in, as a, as a choir or something of that sort uh, uh, in the choir um, as a uh, what would you uh, as a hymn uh, it's a hymn it's a hymn so the church people used to sing and somewhere down the line what happened was that uh, the pope i do not know exactly which year but in uh, sometime around the 60s or something of that sort uh decided that all churches around the world should be singing these uh, hymns in their own languages so that's when uh, uh, you know uh, Uh, all these uh, carols and various things they 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 change to these hymns change to their uh, local languages so therefore kandisa uh, they stopped singing kandisa so rahul had a friend uh, much older than us who used to be in his teens uh, a choir singer and he remembered that uh, song and sang it to him. and he came and sang it to us and we said yeah this is really nice stuff and um and when you hear something so beautiful then uh, your uh, your creative juices also starts acting up and then all of us gave our uh, you know eyes came up with that okay. and um, ashim and amit they gave in that uh, this thing then uh, we realized that in between there we if we, if we and it sounded very spiritual to us and that was the most attractive part of the song so then uh, ashin started taking this alap in the middle of the song and then uh, uh, again uh, you know it had to be it had to be explored more those emotions so then my solo came in and then you know i took it up to a particular crescendo again the song would would start and kandisa is actually just one verse which is repeated three times in the song yeah okay so tell me something sushmi i mean these were like amazing days for independent musicians like yourself today you come up with say 10 songs new compositions mm. where, where are the hmvs and the magna sounds and the times music to listen or to even lend a uh, lend a you know hearing ear to someone like you you know what i am not the best person to ask this question because you know while i was in indian ocean the last two albums we actually uh, you know with the last two albums you no know, uh me then black friday then uh, what was it and then after ocean died we released uh, sola bata tin sutis so sola bata tin sutis we actually released it uh without a company 
so we just released it on uh, social media and we uh, printed our own copies and we sent it to people and so on and you won't believe it uh mm, in my opinion i had the least amount of uh 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 what should i say i uh, i i i did not think that solar beta things so this is going to do that well okay that's my own very individual uh opinion um uh, but we made about three times the money on that because other people came and they wanted to sponsor a johnny walker black label came on board and we made three times the money in six months time that even what kandisa has given given us in royalty oh wow okay when we when we chose not to go with any music company fair enough and i think today i think you know that whole equation is changing when you've got people like you know you got itunes and you've got spotify and whatever where people like yourself can actually go and put up put up their music yeah. and you know get revenue from it um yeah. so when i when, when i uh, uh, composed uh, the whole album depths of the ocean yeah um i i approached a friend of mine who was the ceo at that moment of time of emi and uh, t suresh and i told him would you like to take it and he agreed so uh, in fact at that in, at that point of time they did pay me the uh, recording cost not the complete thing but yeah they had a budget they said they'll give it right uh, and then emi got sold to universal now universal uh, but thankfully my contract with them was only for 5 years and that's way over okay. um and then the second album uh, uh, i did that is ocean to ocean was with uh, harper collins actually approached me to uh, write my uh, autobiography i told them autobiography is too heavy a term i can write some memoirs but there is one condition that you uh i will include the cd in the book oh wow because okay. i realized by that time uh the people who read books are probably the actual listener of my music so that came out with the book and the digital rights were given to uh, another digital company what was the name of the book if i may ask ocean to ocean ocean to ocean and is it still available to to buy yeah, yeah, online yeah yeah. yeah yeah okay good i'll look it up so mm. so we talked about the record companies and whatever another thing i want to sort of go through and is the role of music videos now somewhere in the 80s they came a you must have a music video ideology with any new music that was coming out a single being released or you know and so forth so what's right. your what's your take on that and how has that helped you or worked against you uh well we by the way in indian ocean and outside indian ocean we keep talking about yes video will be a, a good thing to have uh, the unfortunate part is my 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 compositions are at least 8 minutes long if not 15 20 minutes long now who's going to watch 20 minutes and somebody will have to make a movie on that yeah uh but uh, still uh, uh, with indian ocean we 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 uh, release uh, uh, live in delhi um uh, uh, what do you call it uh, a dvd which uh, i think it is still there but nobody is buying dvds and things like that it is available on the net i'm sure i have not checked in a long while uh and uh, also with uh, chronicles uh, uh we did make a video uh on a piece called neptune's dance which is a part of uh, ocean to ocean okay yeah i mean and most difficult part is that you know filmmakers would come and they would say, oh no this is too long can we cut it down can we cut it short mm. i do not compose long pieces just because i've got all the time in my life correct there's a reason that you know the compositions are long 
so I um, but nevertheless even Neptune's dance was kind of chopped a little bit um, I, th- I think it was a s- more than six minute number which was chopped to about four minutes something mm. so the, the other thing I want to talk about maybe I'm just going back to with something we're talking about you know um, our neighboring countries have a great music presence which is outside of their cinema or outside of the, any other entertainment elements they actually have a voice of music right absolutely, that the you, the youth are invested in and I, I used to have this habit when I used to travel with my corporate job if I went to a new country I'd always go into a record shop usually at the duty free and ask for uh, the most popular youth CD in that country and I would buy it regardless of what what uh, language it was in and I'd come back home and I'd listen to it, it gives you a uh, it gives you a taste of what the youth is like in that country, you know, the sort of genre they listen to and so forth, right? Sure, sure. That's not happening. Yeah. That's not happening at the moment, Sushma. And I know I asked you this question a little while ago, but what do you think is that that's doing to our culture, our next future generations? Our future generations, and this is like my, kids of my cousins and so forth, are only growing up listening to film music. They've never heard of independent music artists in, 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 in India. They don't have someone that they can look up to and widen their mu- musical dreams, you know? Yeah, that's... Uh, I think what, what you're talking about is basically Pakistan and uh, Nepal. Okay. Correct. Uh, sorry, uh, Pakistan, Nepal and uh, uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a huge uh, music industry and some amazing uh, albums and music is being made there too. Um... Uh, the reason I would again point out that uh, uh, it is um, uh, Bangladesh or a Pakistan or a Nepal does not have a Bollywood. Yeah, correct. I agree. It it doesn't. And I, I yeah. you know, I mean, as you know, I'm I'm partially associated with with the Bollywood world, and I absolutely yeah. love it, and I'm proud of of a lot of the things that they do. But I just think that we've you know, we become so narrow mind a uh, vision that all we're feeding society and our and our community is, you know, a dose of Bollywood. And I was talking mm-hmm. earlier on today to a film director friend of mine who I'm going to be podcasting with next and saying, you know, isn't it strange that all the success stories and all the tragedies in the world today as per Bollywood only happen to NRIs? There's no more focus on rural India, on the stories that set in the villages and little towns, you know. Some of it is coming back with the OTT platform and I hope that the OTT platform will also bring back a different level of music that we once knew when we were growing up. And also Mm -hmm. what happened was, thanks to Netflix, I got exposed to the music of an amazingly talented gentleman called Pratik Kuhud. You know who did the music for Little Things, a web series on Netflix. Pratik, Pratik Kuhar. Yeah, Pratik Kuhar, correct. And but I. But that's not rural India. But that's not rural India. No, no, but that wasn't. But again, it was independent music. It was independent that... music coming out into a show that wasn't necessarily mainstream. I mean, Little Things was not mainstream in any way. It was. It, it had its own niche. The the storytelling, the way it was filmed. <laughs> The, and especially the music and that's how I got introduced to the work of Pratik and I think you know it's another great uh, story for for Indian uh, for Indian music so you know now that you're talking about that you must listen to this little girl or I won't say little girl very young girl called she calls her, herself Dot she's Aditi Sahagal okay Aditi and Sahagal. she's okay. a singer songwriter and uh, my kids uh, introduce, introduced uh, me to her music. She plays the piano and makes all the videos from home. I'm not very sure what is her latest thing, but whatever I've heard, she is outstanding. Okay. She's outstanding. Yes. So, you know, okay, well, so you got Aditi Sahigal, you're just talking about Pratik, like I'm talking about the newer generation. Once upon a time, yeah. musicians picked up, a, we picked up their instrument and played and that's all they did but today they seem to be wanting to add effects digitize you know 
bringing loops and everything it's become very factoried okay what is That's that true. doing susmit to our future generations imagination to, uh, within the music industry look it is uh, uh, this has this has uh, uh, there are two things behind this i think it is a social media a you can uh, put out any music that you create on social media media and the other thing is the ease of producing music because of all the amazing softwares that have come in okay so i i know that people who are not even musicians they they have maybe some kind of aesthetic sense how to choose loops this that and so on and and they make a composition out of it and the uh, the, the the internet the social media is so full of it unfortunately you know initially when social media came in i thought that it's going to be really good for the music industry because at least people can show their uh, showcase their uh, work on social media without even having to perform uh, live and things like that because that 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 gives them uh, an instant listenership if okay um uh, and and uh, in contrast i'll tell you how when i started in the notion first 5 years we have played only seven shows in today's date if there is a new band within 3 months i'm sure they would have played seven shows okay uh <coughs> so i thought that this is going to really good uh, do good to the music industry out here especially independent musicians but it is so flooded with a lot of i'm sorry to say so much of crap that i think people have even forgotten what it is to listen to good music right. and um, so where does a person find because it's a haystack where i will find the needle yeah because you know when when we were growing up and we were learning an instrument we always as you said earlier on you know you wanted to play the beatles and you wanted to play that kind of music and i just fear that you know for the for, for the generations coming by are they even going to have that exposure to the authentic version of these songs if not because all they're doing is growing up listening to remixed and you know uh digitized That's versions true. yeah so i i i must talk a little bit about uh, my experience my <clears throat> when i was with uh, hmb in yeah. the early 90s so uh the one of the vice presidents asked me listen you are a musician yourself we would like to uh, no uh, so uh, why don't you see what kind of folk music that we can actually uh, get to hear so i um, went uh, and uh, whatever little knowledge of folk music that i had i realized that uh, around delhi in the north of india uh, the finest uh, folk musicians were from rajasthan so yeah. i went and did a huge 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 research work on that and it was a almost a thesis that i had submitted and uh, that basically what i uh, uh, submitted and um, okay i'll complete this story but when they saw the cost of it and so on and they said that no we are not going to do this uh, but there is somebody called gulabo the kalbelia dancer she is getting famous all over the world why don't you go and record her music i kept telling them that listen she is a fantastic dancer i agree but she also dances to a lot of these langas and mangniyas tunes okay they are not great musicians they are great dancers but just because she was getting famous somebody's brain worked in that direction i was asked to uh, go and record gulabo's troupe uh experience was fantastic product was not good at all i normally do not talk about it although i produced it uh, um but what made me go through was you know in those days some of the very old musicians you know the from uh, the manganias or the langas who used to see, sing songs which today's generation has forgot and why have they forgotten because suddenly somewhere down the line bollywood wanted uh, these musicians to come and sing uh, uh, their folk songs in bollywood with a lot of other instrumentations and so on and so forth i'm not saying that they were bad but the 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 the, the youngsters realized that they can only sell the fast moving tracks and things like that so today when i ask these people and i talk about the olden days 30 years back these 
guys do not know those really in depth compositions that they used to sing and that's how you kill uh 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 a particular form of folk art like it has not yet been killed but a lot has lot of it has been taken away correct correct so 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 that brings me to the other question now and this is more sort of coming into your domain here now the fusion discussion okay where is fusion music in the world and especially does india have an appetite for the fusion music that i associate with you like indian ocean with what you do with what shakti used to do for example you know shakti was shakti, i would uh, yeah sorry yeah, go on no go on yeah shakti you yeah. know that thing i got introduced to shakti when i was a student in london and somebody said to me have you heard of shakti and i said no nope. have you heard of zakir hussain i said yeah and they said about well, zakir hussain's band and i went to my first shakti concert when i was in london and that's when i fell in love with the music but you know yeah. i had to go out of india to to discover that so where is mm. india with fusion music uh, like stuff that you that you create okay uh, uh first let us let us try and uh, describe what is fusion music right now uh, if you were talking about shakti being fusion music i would say you go back to the you know 40s and 50s and 50s and 60s bollywood music where you see uh, uh you know uh, jazz standards being sung in you know mera na you know those kind of so- songs uh, a lot of uh, uh western music was being played with indian instruments a lot of uh, indian style of music was playing with western instruments wouldn't you call that fusion yeah okay i'll i'll, I'll okay. yeah yeah so so uh, and probably around that time uh, when uh, ravi shankar went out and he started collaborating with philharmonic philharmonic orchestras yehudi menuhin that was also fusion right so fusion the that you cannot possibly any longer say that this is fusion and this is not okay so uh, that's my huh? well, so what would you label your genre of music like the depth of the i don't know it i don't label it look the thing is that when you consciously when you consciously try and fuse uh, uh western music with indian music or african music with western music or chinese music with indian music when you're consciously doing that you probably can call it fusion in my opinion uh, uh when um uh, when the 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 mixture of all these music has happened very organically within you i in my mind fusion is something which is uh, experimental and experiment cannot express only when you have internalized each and every aspect of it and you've grown up with it then you can express through that so expression does not happen in experimentation or fusion in my opinion good point good point really well said on that yeah so uh so uh as far as i am concerned i mean whatever my father used to travel all, all around the world so he used he used to get me lps from all over the place you know from poland from germany from uh, uh you know where, all the places that he had gone to and uh, that had kind of opened up my mind towards music from all over the world and i realized that people who are who just stick to a particular genre because i know people who only listen to blues yeah the amount of music and emotions that they are losing out on is not funny correct correct right so i tell the people who are into indian classical who are only into indian classical music there there is it is not this, that this is the greatest form of expression to music it is one of the finest i would definitely say but it is not the greatest okay and there are different formats you see there are different formats i mean uh, i've been reading up about you know who said what about different say say indian classical music even ravindranath said had talked about that why do you have to elaborate a particular raga for that long a period of time okay 
I have, but I have also sat through Nikhil Banerjee's two and a half hour long recital of one raga, and I was mesmerized from beginning till the end. That is another thing. Okay, but then there are uh, uh, other ways of thought processes. I mean, you you have to imbibe a lot of other things, and you know, from the rest of the world. Okay, like Sujitri when he 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 first uh, took Ravi Shankar for his uh, first movie, Pater Pachali. Then he worked with Nikhil Banerjee, he worked with Vilayat Khan Sahab, and Ali Akbar Khan Sahab, and then then he realized that these guys are fantastic musicians, but they're not film music uh, producers. So when he wanted a you know ten second piece, he used to give him a half an hour piece and give you know you choose from here. So after that, Satyajit started doing his own music. And what amazing music! Yep, correct. So I'm going to move the discussion now and make it personal. So yeah. I have been listening to a lot of your work. I mean, besides Indian Ocean, uh, yeah. you know, I've been listening to a lot of your work since last week, and I, I think I've listened to most of your you know, your chronicles and the Iceberg Project. And I've also yeah. been very fortunate to have listened to one of your pieces of unreleased music. which i mm. which completely blew me away okay so let's talk about two of these pieces the depth of the ocean and take me up how did those originate in you and let's okay let's break it down depth of the ocean you know uh, so complex uh, so long so uh, you, you won't believe it you won't uh, the depths of the ocean i had composed before i formed in the ocean Okay, uh, and way before, I remember when I, me and Oshim were playing as a duo, we had performed it in our first Roorkee concert in 1986. Wow. Okay, but yeah, and then and believe you me, this particular composition has not actually changed uh, much. Maybe if there has been any change from then to now, it would be uh, probably about maximum five percent. And um, and then finally, when I did it with Melanie, which all gave it another twist altogether, um, and it is there in the album called Depths of the Ocean. So there are various different renditions of Depths of the Ocean. Um, so uh, what was in my mind at that point of time? But I know there's a story behind it now. And the story that I tell people is that you know it's about uh, imagine this amazing creature coming out from. the depths of the ocean and uh, whether you can see it or you can imagine it as smoke or you can just feel it this huge thing comes out and it does not have uh, the, the good thing about this humongous creature that it is not scary to people and when it comes and settles down in society it brings peace and when it brings brings peace into this society uh, uh, where i think i i i i Hope the listeners they go through that particular this thing. It comes to a crescendo where it drops down and you can get the peace. And uh, then what happens is that the rulers and the politicians they realize that there's peace without us. The I mean they 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 have a huge amount of insecurity. Of so course. then there is a lot of back and forth that happens. You know the politicians are screaming at the masses. You know this is not good for you, and the masses are screaming back. Hey, listen now, we do not need you. so yeah. this thing goes back and forth back and forth back and forth and finally the creature goes back exactly the same way as it had come out in the depths of the ocean almost saying that probably you guys do not deserve it you know sir smith i think i need to come on hang out with you and smoke or drink whatever you've been consuming because <laughs> this sounds incredible i mean my god look at the just hearing the story behind that song now when i listen to it again after this it's going to be a completely different experience and thank you for sharing yeah but i also do not uh, on the other hand i also do not want to uh, uh, color people's minds uh, uh, when they are listening to or uh, experiencing any form of art yeah so smith and i have just refilled our drinks so be prepared for this to get even more intense so smith before we took a took uh, an opportunity so, to okay, uh, let me complete the last bit uh, yeah. uh, so i do not try to color people's minds when they are going to any uh, form of art but uh, yeah but my way of uh, making music is a lot about storytelling uh, so even iceberg project or uh, 
torrent or uh, so many other uh, pieces that i've made whether it's serendipity you will see that there are different different i would call them movements like thing they call it in western classical music intimacy right. or even take me up yeah. yes yeah yeah so so how did take me up come about uh Uh, again i you know when these things come it comes so naturally and when it comes up the first thing i try and tell myself whether uh, uh whether i have this sounds in any which way familiar familiar to anything else that i've heard in this world okay mm. and if i if anybody points out or if i think that it is then i throw it out of the window wow so yeah so uh, uh that's how i go about it. now uh, and when when these kind of things like melancholic ecstasy if you heard i remember waking up one day and playing the complete piece that's and uh, and only thing when i started playing with the band it was a much much longer thing i had to cut it short and obviously i had to bring it into a pattern so that they could follow so just because okay. if it was hang on mm-hmm. let's let's just take this situation you're fast asleep something comes to you you wake up and you start playing it right and you say hmm huh, this sounds good to me so you call up your your buddies who are part of your band let's just say I'm one of them and you say hey to go come over uh yeah. how do you translate that vision or the parts or the complexities of that to your fellow musicians in the band oh i first play out that complete tune i explain what what it is uh, all about and where i want to, what kind of a beat pattern and what i want the bass player to be doing what uh, kind of a beat pattern that i want from the uh, drums and uh, so on and so forth and then also if there are vocals in my mind then i tell them and i play those parts i i'm not a good singer at all so i play them out on my guitar and say that this is a tune and please sing it okay. and then uh, the brilliant musicians that i have with me they also come with their their own uh, a bit of improvisations on that and that makes it even better so how do okay let's just say i'm playing i'm playing bass for uh, you know i'm playing say i'm playing the drums for you okay So how do I know that I am aligned with your vision on the drums with the beats about to change you know uh, I mean the rhythm changes the style changes and mm. in a uh, any other instrument the melody changes even I mean you've got like five or six or seven eight melodies happening in one song and same thing right. with, those, with those different rhythms happening in parts of so, the song how does that get translated something- to your bodies sometimes uh, uh the beat patterns are simple right when uh and sometimes it is kind of complex like this up for take 9 uh is a nine beat pattern the, uh, more than half the piece is nine beat pattern right so then i have to explain exactly what am i wanting uh, uh, from different uh, and then then comes certain suggestions like what melani has done in uh, up for take 9 is fantastic or uh, say what um uh gayatri or sudhir have done in certain of the vocal uh, bits when uh, um, uh, all i have to tell them at you know not this that i have to tell them beat by beat that this is what you have to play because there are certain beat patterns which are quite generic but then comes uh, then comes part say in 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 uh, iceberg project in this latter half there comes a part where i go into a 10 beat pattern okay but i play it in such a way that i repeat it and i come to a 20 bar uh, 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 beat pattern where obviously the four beat pattern comes and merges back into the 10 beat so if you remember so that part okay and at that point of time i i, I remember uh, nandit did take a good amount of time to see exactly what he would like to play does it continue with the four beat pattern is it actually uh, uh, clashing uh, there or not and then he came out with the pattern which was lovely 
So talking about Nandit and Melanie, I mean, I watched a video, an interview where you three were sitting on a couch and talking about, I think it was talking about intimacy, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, mm-hmm. Mel- Melanie, you know, I mean, fairly, you know, correctly said that she was trained in Western classical music. And then when she got involved with working with you, she was the first thing that hit her was how complex your compositions were and how, you know, there were different parts to this. Um, do you think it helped her being a classically trained musician to relate and, you know, uh, soak in what you were trying to do? And how was it with Nandit? Mm, okay. Now, uh, first, let me uh, talk about uh, Melanie. Yeah. Uh, um, Melanie, uh, obviously, she grew up uh, learning how to read music and play it. Right. Uh, and that is the easiest way for her to play something. So she was, she loved my music. She wanted to play uh, with me the moment he heard, uh, she heard my music. But it took certain amount of time for her to work on it and uh, come to where we came to. Okay. Um, as far as Nandit is concerned, Nandit, Nandit's mother is an Indian classical vocalist. And okay. she's fairly well known. I, uh, uh, her name is Subhadra Desai. And uh, she's a very good singer. And so she, he has been brought up in a musical family. And his one of the biggest inspirations was actually Indian Ocean. Okay. Wow. Uh, okay. Uh, and he grew up listening to Indian Ocean music. So he, uh, for him to actually connect with me and... Uh, um, it was much, much easier for him. No doubt about it. But I, I'm going to be very honest that both of them, and especially Melanie, because she's coming from completely a different culture, never heard uh, Indian classical music or any anything Indian before this. And to be able to do uh, such brilliant stuff in my uh, compositions, hats off to her. Yeah, I mean, hats, absolutely. Absolutely hats off. And it's amazing what she brings to the table. And so so with your fellow other musicians, you know, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's Nandit or, or Varun or whoever else that, you, that you're jamming up with. But it's it's really, it, it's, it really is so heartwarming to see this art of music being mm-hmm. kept alive, to see this art of music, to see the discipline of these musicians who are keeping alive the intelligence, you know, in the creativity of the music that 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 they that that they do it. So, um, what I wanted to ask you was, and finally was, so what's next for you? What are you working on next? And can we see, you know, some of? Well, there are lots of new compositions now. The thing is that uh, this pandemic and this lockdown, well, lockdown has been uh, is it's not really a lockdown, but uh, the fact that uh, it is still uh, not so easy to come together as a band and practice and so on. Uh, well, I would love love to. I mean, uh, continue my collaboration with uh, Melanie and Nandi. So let's see when we she can come over or I can go over. So that is uh, out in the open. I mean, anybody's guess as to how. Um, and this pandemic has taken a toll on all of us. I'm sure about that in any which way. But it's a good time to sit and compose and write, isn't it? Being stuck at home. Not, not, not this that I have not done that. But then if I have to explore it with my other band members, that yeah. is a difficulty. Okay. And also at this point of time, um, uh, everybody has taken a beating. You see, I mean, I mean, tens or twenties uh, of shows got cancelled in one go, one go, and we still do not know when are we going to go, go and perform live in front of people. So I have been doing some uh, uh, virtual shows, and uh, but. There's a limitation. Uh, firstly, the same effect to play in front of an audience and to play virtually is uh, very, very, very different. But I have had some uh, some good responses, some not so good responses. I, I played for US and Europe and things like that. They, they were not bad. 
But in India, when I played, I, I realized that nobody wants to buy tickets. And yeah. even if I right. want to do it, uh, uh, for at least a handful of my uh, associates and co-musicians and uh, um, sound engineer, managers. So, uh, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, people in India do not want to buy tickets. So, Susmith, okay. So, you've been talking about lots of compositions coming up. I have to ask you this question. I know the answer, but I'm still going to ask you. Record labels or Spotify? The way ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, record labels, I can tell you one thing, at this point of time, no record label is spending money to have an album, in my knowledge. In your, I mean, okay. you an independent album? An independent album, yeah. and nobody. Um, but, uh, I, and as far as Spotify and the electronic media is concerned, I am so paranoid about this particular whole thing because I don't understand a thing of it. Tagore, it is, it is so, so, so I completely depend on others when it comes to uh, this uh, whole thing about the uh, social media, so the Spotify and Amazon and this, that and very say I music. How to place it there, how to uh, publicize it, Again, I'm telling you, there's so much of music in uh, social media today. I mean, how do I uh, even go to figure out that it should reach out to uh, at least a handful of people who know that this is good news? Okay, so Smita, I have... I'm going to take the liberty to answer that question on your behalf. Given that we've okay. only been talking for the past few days, record labels right. or Spotify, I'm, t I'm saying it on behalf of you, it's going to be Spotify. Okay. Uh, because I, remember we were talking about some stuff about this yesterday, and uh, we'll have we'll carry on that chat after this podcast is done. But I think the future definitely has got to be digital platforms to promote your to promote your amazing music and reaching out to people around the world. And I really, really hope that that happens. Okay, uh, for my listeners, if you haven't heard of Indian Ocean, uh, it's going to be very rare if, if you're an Indian and you haven't heard of them but for my non-Indian uh, listeners there was a band called Indian Ocean you can look them up on YouTube and I also will ask you to look up Susmith Saint Chronicles and look up no, the, the band ice still the, the band still exists they are performing no okay and and look up something called the Iceberg Project I can assure you that you haven't heard of anything like this before it is absolutely amazing uh, it's something that you can sit down by yourself and get lost in, in what you're listening to. It actually has a power to carry you away in, in, into another dimension. It's that powerful and it's that amazing. Or even the Sound Company series, there are about six, seven compositions that are, that are there on YouTube, played completely live, <coughs> recorded live, shot live, everything is live about it. Maybe what I'll do, Susmith, is later on I'll, I'll, I'll add the links to these YouTube channels as part of this podcast. So it'll make it easier for people to get access to your music. Yeah. Okay. By the way, okay. by the way okay. and I'm going to embarrass you now because I'm going to prove to people what a dinosaur you are, if I may say so. You are not on social media, are you? I, I have uh, 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 an Instagram uh, handle. I, no I am way. there. Really? Uh, no, no, no. Hold on. I, I do, but I am not the person who handles it. And I very recently a new manager has joined me. So I'm hoping that he is going to do things with it. In the month of March, actually, what happened? My uh, uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook got hacked. And my um, my followers, they came down to about one third of what I had earlier. And I have no way to know exactly how uh, to go back to it. And again, the way I, I got the Facebook account back was only because I have got some very beautiful friends who contacted Facebook directly and they got it back to me. Uh, but I have lost out two years of postings more than two years of postings and uh, all the posts that I had made and also uh, also uh, about two-thirds of my 
followers but listen thank you so much for talking to me and it means so much just to be able to have this sort of a conversation with somebody you know whose work i've admired for a long long time i wish you all the best and i and i say you know keep this great music coming and i think you you need to put your music out there for the world to listen to but i think it'd be a shame if the world goes by without listening to more and more of your music so thank you very much yeah. out here i must also tell the audience the listeners uh that i happened to watch one of uh, tagore's films it's called uh, god of sinners the god of sinners oh yes um, if you if you please do go and watch it it's a beautifully uh, made film uh, and it talks about today's reality and uh, i think that's all i should say and not explain the thing uh, so uh, it's a pleasure speaking to you also as you are also such an amazing creator thank you susmit means a lot coming from you and i this is this has really been great thank you so much and best of luck with everything that you do cheers thank you thank you cheers cheers, cheers.